I'm going to largely talk about something called address-based online surveying, or at least that's what we call it within our, our company, Kantar. But address-based online surveying is really part of a, a larger family of designs which are called push-to-web, uh, which you, a term you may well have come across um, before now. What I'm not talking about, though, is online panels, such as uh, YouGov have and Kantar itself has a very large uh, online panel as well. These are used for more online research than anything I talk about. Uh, the vast majority of it comes through online panels. But at, at its heart, an online panel is a convenient sample. So a, a large number of volunteers, uh, YouGov and Kantar and all the rest th of them will then sample from these panels and br bring in a sort of broadly representative samples that are demographically balanced uh, from this this pool but ultimately this pool is of people who are quite keen to do surveys very very frequently indeed which is uh, I would say a convenient sample and probably only about 0.5 percent of the population is a member of a, an online panel so so far as there are biases within that group that are go beyond the demographic factors um, they will carry through into the surveys themselves now that isn't always a problem um, almost all opinion polling, for example, is carried out using online panels because you can put the survey through and within sometimes only 24 hours, sometimes even less than that, get some, some answers back from that. And there's no form of random sampling with any kind of response maximisation, which is typical of social research. None of that's going to work in a, in a polling uh, scenario, though Curtis may mention a few uh, counterexamples to that. So I'm not talking about that, I'm really talking about when, we th when we're trying to get a random sample of, uh, of some sort, i.e. we're going to believe that random sampling is better than sampling from convenient samples. Anyway, so just as a, a prelude to that. So first of all, uh, what and why is push to web? So what is push to web surveying? Effectively, the sample is, is and it could be a sample of anything really, any, any population, is contacted offline which might be by post, it might be by telephone, it might be in person, but it's not online because there is no sample frame of people uh, that you can contact online that is, is at all representative. So they're contacted offline and asked to complete a questionnaire online, uh, while other response modes which may be available are actually downplayed or are only offered to people after they have not responded to the uh, request to do it online. So that's uh, effectively what it is. But why do we want to push people to respond online in the first place? Um, first of all, and this is probably 98% of the reason, uh, in some circumstances, well, probably most circumstances, online completions cost less uh, than other types, which means that either the research commissioner can simply spend less on research and spend more on other things or spend less uh, in grand total, or they can spend just as much but get larger samples. So Pat showed, for example, how with the science education tracker, he was able to get a sample of, of 4,000, whereas previously he had a sample of 450. So there are a lot more analytical um, options available to him once he had a larger sample size. So that's the, the main reason. It's also more convenient for some people because uh, than, there's no need for interview appointments to be kept. Uh, and the questionnaire can be done bit by bit. It doesn't have to be done all in one chunk. Although why, in theory, interviews can be done in, in little chunks as well. In practice, that's quite impractical. And most people, once they've started an interview, feel they've got to finish it. So whereas the uh, online uh, survey completion can be done fitted around other things. So it's, it's got a convenience factor there. Also with online surveying, you can use visual prompts. So you can use pictures, even video more dynamic kind of question design than is possible with, say, paper or, or with telephone. And you can do most of these things with face-to-face -face interviewing, but face-to-face -face interviewing is the most expensive type. So that when you're doing online surveying, it's not really the rival. The rival is really these other forms like uh, paper and telephone and so on. It also finally, and least consequentially, uh, seems modern to many uh, research commissioners. Um, or at least not as antiquated as interviewing. Many research commissioners, and especially their uh, political masters, think it's vaguely ridiculous to actually send somebody round to somebody's house and take up their time with an interview, or even call uh, 
call people up to do that because they themselves would never do any of those things and they don't know any of their friends who would do these things either whereas they can imagine it uh, more the other way around there's also the government itself has a digital by default attitude if you like that's percolated through which is that they try to do that first even to the point where if somebody calls up and says I, I'm not online I don't want to do this online their first approach is actually to try and help them do it online rather than offer some alternative mode of, of getting a service and so on. So they are very much in that mindset. So uh, that's one of the other reasons, advantages, if you like, of online, although it's a rather t small advantage. Now, there's lots of varieties of push to web designs uh, and the contact approach, of course, depends on what is known about the sampled household or individual or, or organisation. Now the contact itself, although I've said it's offline and that could be through the telephone or in person, it's almost always written contact rather than expensive personal contact. As soon as you get people involved, you get cost involved. And one of the principal advantages of online surveying uh, is lost. Now the contact mode itself can include mailed letters, it can include emails, can include SMS text messaging, it can include uh, use of various social media platforms and so on. Uh, all depending on what you've got uh, and all available contact modes tend to be used when they are in fact uh, available and it's also typical to send two to three reminders if you're doing social research as most of, of the literature suggests that maximizing the number of contact opportunities if you like maximizes the probability of response more than anything else you can put into your design. Simply putting the survey in front of people's faces is by far the most effective thing you can do. Now, it's quite easy to hear this and say, well, this sounds like bombardment. Uh, and potentially, that could reduce response probabilities to your second mode, for instance. So if somebody doesn't respond online, you might then offer them, say, a paper questionnaire uh, as an alternative. But you think, well, just a minute, I've bombarded them with the online request. Now they're not, they're definitely not going to do the paper questionnaire so on. So there's some risk of that. There's also, if you're using online within a longitudinal study, if you've done all this bombardment, it can put people off potentially. So these are the theories, at least. Now, so far, I at least have not seen much evidence that any of these things actually uh, matter in practice. Uh, but it's also fair to say that push to web designs are pretty new uh, in social research. And so the absence of evidence of, of this sort of effect is not really evidence of, of that that effect isn't there, evidence of absence. So here, I'll give you a couple of examples in the UK. Uh, there are several major longitudinal surveys that have used Push to Web as part of their design. Uh, Understanding Society itself, which is the largest survey carried out in Britain, from wave seven onwards is Push to Web, and if they don't do it by web, uh, we'll do, they do it face to face. So it goes straight to face to face interview. It doesn't go through the telephone mode, although there are a very tiny number of people who do complete it by telephone when, every, when it's complete desperation at the end of, uh, end of the wave. But basically, it's just web and then face to face. Uh, since web, wave seven, gradually a greater percentage of the understanding society has been put into this model, although there's a reserved one-fifth of it that just goes straight to face to face and that's done so that some effort can be made to me uh, identify measurement effects between completing the questionnaire on web and completing it through uh, an interview but initially it was quite a struggle to get people to do it by web but now generally of those that are put through there about 50 percent complete it by by web and a little under that will complete it uh, face to face Another example, the National Child Development Study started in 1958 uh, and this was the age 55 sweep. This one, is, uh, they already had varied it with face to face for most of the waves of that survey, but sometimes using telephone. And this particular one, they used web and then telephone for the remainder, uh, primarily because it was the age 55 and we'd seen in other surveys that so this was the absolute sweet spot to get people to respond to an online survey. It's not young people, it's people in middle age and late middle age. And indeed the response rate from the web part was about 62, 63%. And the overall response rate adding on the telephone part was greater than telephone on its own. 
which isn't always the case, that a lot of these mixed mode studies don't have higher response rates than a single mode study. In this case, it did, did slightly better. Another one is Next Steps, which uh, follows a, a group of people uh, who were 13 and 14 in a particular year, follows them every year for about seven years until they get to a point where they're either in higher education or well into their uh, labour market. Uh, DfE has sponsored that, and there are two waves of that. Uh, um, waves five to eight of the original cohort were done with web, then telephone for the rest, and then face to face. And that model is used from wave four of the of the new cohort as well. And in this case, the response rate from up to online is about 45%, and uh, the other 45% who respond do it by one of the other modes. In fact, face to face is barely used at all in in uh, next steps. Only about 10 or 15%. Uh, completed that way. Both Next Steps and Understanding Society both have response rates around the 85 to 90 percent mark because they're quite well in uh, studies that are well along. Now mixed mode studies like this are far more complex to manage than uh, single mode studies and the data is more complex to use so it's not just a sort of free lunch uh, in using these, these cheaper modes. Now the measurement effects in particular are sometimes substantial which makes causal inference more difficult for those using uh, the data. So I had a look at the very latest uh, wave of next steps and in this there's most of them have gone web then telephone then face to face but there are others that have gone telephone then face to face and then another set that just went straight to face to face. There's a number of experimental subgroups there and I hoped that this approach would allow me to actually identify some measurement effects given that response to each of these mode sequences didn't seem particularly different. Um, and in fact, there are masses of measurement effects. If indeed they are measurement effects, there are masses of them all over the place. So that those using that data, in almost every bit of analysis you do, you need to, in some sense, um, account for the fact that the mode is collected uh, from different modes. Uh, data collection savings in a model which is web and then face-to-face, -face, which is understanding society. Now, uh, the ESRC very much pressed ISA, who run Understanding Society, to make sure that web data collection was in there. But in fact, the savings of data collection costs are only about 10%. The reason is that interviewers still have to travel to all the same sample areas as they otherwise would have. And they've got a smaller set of households to go to, but they're all the harder ones, the ones that don't uh, respond online. So it's all the low hanging fruit has gone. So the cost of each per unit is it higher than it otherwise would be and they're still we still need this vast field force to do it. So although online is used there, it's not the principle of saving costs is not really being not being realised that much. Although it still amounts to a couple of million quid because it's a massive uh, a massive study. Cross sectional studies. Um, there's two types of these. First are with name based samples, which are great. Uh, Pat's given a good example there of the science education monitor. Uh, but uh, another similar design was with the DfE, which is a pupil and parent survey. So again, they were sampled from the National Pupil Database, wrote to the parents, parents completed a survey, and then the, the child also, the sampled child also completed it, and the data was, was put together. Confidentiality sort of separating the two off, so one group didn't see, uh, see the other. So a couple of examples of that. So these are the great cases because there's no additional sampling. If you're sampling addresses, you always, you're never actually interested in the population of addresses. You've got to do a bit more sampling beyond that. So here you're not having to do that. There's a better chance of response if you're actually writing to somebody personally and actually if you've got their name right, for starters, that's nice. Uh, stronger data safeguards in the sense that if you're writing to an address and then you're trying to randomly sample somebody, almost anybody it's quite difficult to put together data safeguards so that one person who completed the survey, their data can't be looked at by uh, somebody else in the household. There's a little bit more protection there. And there's also, if the sample frame is informative enough, as I think the National Pupil Database uh, is, there is a potential for some tailored communications to encourage people to take part. The tailored communications when you don't know anything, such as when you're writing to addresses, they have almost undetectably small effects and are not really worth spending a massive amount of time on. But if you've actually got some reasonable data from a sample frame, you've got some options there. But uh, what I'm going to talk about is, of course, is address-based samples. Um, now, most of the big 
national surveys done in Britain, they're all sampled from the postcode address file and interviewers go out there, of course. But of course, so we use the same frame, the same postcode address file for that. It's comprehensive, covers about 98% of the general population uh, of Britain, but it's sparse, so it hasn't got anything else on it. You can attach some things to it, so you can uh, use small area data, which is available, uh, mostly census data, but there's also some benefits database, database data, uh, medical data, and so on, which is aggregated at the small area level, tells you something about the place. There's also, if you go to vendors like CACI or Experian, they'll tell you that they can give you some address level or even individual level data, which you can stick onto this, this sample to make it richer. However, we've done some, some work with that, and the accuracy level is probably not what you were hoping for. It's useful in the sense it can increase the efficiency of sample designs, but that's all it can do. So most of the time, despite what they say, you know, they can't even get the count of people right in the household a lot of the time. So I wouldn't trust that altogether, but it can be useful um, in terms of survey design. Uh, our approach with address-based samples is we call ABOS within Kantar, which is address-based online surveying, but it's ultimately based on designs that were originally worked up in the United States by Donald Dillman and some of his, some of his colleagues, but just adapted for uh, the UK. So what is ABOS itself? Well, it's got a very simple uh, basic design. A stratified random sample of addresses is drawn from the postcode address file. An invitation letter is sent to the residents of that address containing one or more usernames and passwords plus the URL of a survey website. Questionnaires are always device agnostic these days, which really means you've designed it to be done on a smartphone, and or, le or at least to work fairly well there. There are a few still going where the uh, questionnaire is not what you might call mobile optimized, um, but for the most part, that, that is kind of routine these days. But within that basic design, there are lots of variants possible. Firstly, uh, what happened, what, how do you sample within these addresses? Do you take one person at random who lives there, or do you take all of them, or do you take one or, two, you know, two, one or two of them? That sort of thing. What sort of reminder communications should you use? Should you use letters? Should you use postcards? What kind of responsive design might you use in order to try and uh, make sure that the responding sample is as representative as possible? Is there any evolving mes message strategy you can adopt to get yourself through the, the various stages of this communication? Because that's all you've got is your, is your letters in this case. Incentives, what value should be they be? Should they be targeted at particular sorts of addresses rather th than others? And complementary modes, should you offer a paper option for those who can't or won't do it online, or a separate interview survey? Any of these kinds of things. There's lots of variants here, most of which we've done at least one uh, survey of, this, of, of that type. So here is, and I realised from having sitting there, nobody's ever going to be able to read any of this. This is an example of letter. This is actually taken from the 2016 to 17 uh, Community Life Survey, which is, was originally a Cabinet Office survey about sort of social action and volunteerism. It's now in the uh, Department of Culture, Media and Sport. And this is the original ABOS uh, study in the, in the UK. But you can see I've printed the left and right hand side so you can see uh, there's a, a nice logo for the, uh, for the study. Uh, you've got a, a very short introduction to what it's about, incredibly vague, because to be honest, with random sampling, I'd rather have a vague introduction to what the survey is about and something super specific that's trying to engage people in it because I don't really want a sample full of people who are interested in the topic. I want some people to have different motivations for actually taking part. So there's a, a vague but friendly, vague but friendly uh, introduction. Then you've got underneath it the passcodes highlighted uh, and the passwords to use. Uh, and on the back of it, though you don't see that here, is lots of sort of uh, kind of frequently asked questions, that sort of thing. And it's in colour. Uh, and it, importantly, on the, the top left is HM Government. And we don't tend to actually say the actual department's name. We always try and use HM Government, with a couple of exceptions, those being the Home Office, uh, HMRC, uh, and one or two others that have equal impact to uh, being written to by HM Government. 
Now, we originally conceptualized ABOS as a lower cost alternative to uh, RDD, which uh, Pat mentioned, random digit dialing, in which the Ofcom's grand scheme of telephone numbers is used as a sample frame and num ran numbers are randomly generated from that. Now, it used to be that you just use landline numbers, um, but now people, lots of people don't answer landlines and lots of people don't even plug phones in and lots of people don't even have them at all. So now you have to have mobile as well. The problem is that mobile is tremendously expensive because every call is screened, so it's incredibly difficult to actually get people to even answer uh, the phone. Uh, which means that interviewers are spending much longer there than they otherwise would. Uh, and also, the actual call costs themselves are greater. There's masses of answer phones and uh, all that sort of thing. So it's no longer a particularly viable uh, format. And the most recent one I've we've done, which was actually only last month, found that um, the ABOS equivalent, it was an ABOS on one side and a parallel RDD, and the ABOS cost half as much. And the RDD sample was about £50 per completed interview. So it was no longer the cheap and cheerful method it uh, used to be. But the advantage of ABOS is also that it's more flexible with regard to both the size and its size and shape than interview surveys. So the biggest ABOS study that's in currently in Britain has a sample size of, I think, about 170,000 annually, which is certainly bigger than any telephone survey there is. Uh, but also, we've done about a dozen hyperlocal surveys. So we have did a survey of people who just live around uh, Liverpool's Anfield Stadium, uh, but and also a number of other uh, locations where we were effectively sampling a whole chunk of addresses and getting a sample of three or 400 respondents from hyperlocal areas. Impossible to do with RDD, hard enough to do with face-to-face -face interviews as well. So there's some advantages there. It's also unclustered. Uh, and even if an online panel has ultimately been sourced by interviews, that will have been uh, clustered. Um, so there's some advantages there in terms of uh, the uh, precision of the data. Now, the first test, as I said, was although we originally thought, well, we're sick of dual frame RDD, we've got to have something else. The first test we actually did was uh, with a face to face interview survey. Community Life was actually a success of a much longer running survey called the Citizenship Survey which is a face-to-face -face interview survey uh, in 2012. In fact, we ran it again as the first year of this. And the response rate is about 60%. It's about half an hour interview and so on. Now, half an hour is quite long, traditionally for online. Uh, and 60%, of course, is very high response rate. So it was going to be different uh, um, from that. But, and there's been a lot of parallel work, lots of testing over the last few years of that is now used as a sole data collection method for community life. So it broadly passed the tests that were set for it over that, over that period. We've also used it for about six other clients, uh, most recently with the Financial Conduct Authority on some vast survey, which was of unbelievable complexity about people's financial products that they have bought or not bought. Uh, but also, as I say, Ipsos Mori uses a variant of it for Active Lives, which is the vast sports survey that I mentioned before. Now, I wrote a, an article about uh, nearly a year ago now, which was published in the SRA's Social Research Practice volume, which attempted to answer these seven questions. And I'm going to tr try and go through each of those questions here. So the first question was, if the samples of addresses, how do you convert it into a sample of individuals? Second was, how do you verify that the data you get is, in fact, from the sampled individual? Or Thirdly, how do you cover offline individuals who are still a part of the population here? Fourth, what response rate do you get? What's the impact of design features that you've tested? Fifth, how does response rate vary between subpopulations? What, if anything, can you do about it? Uh, sixth, what evidence do you have for non-response bias on the actual substantive uh, topics? And Number seven, how much does it cost? So I attempted to answer all of those questions. Got more evidence now. I've actually brought more in now, in today, than I've actually got in that uh, journal article. So firstly, how do you convert a sample of addresses into a sample of individuals? Well, first of all, there are a small number of addresses, about 2% of addresses contain multiple households. Um, they're reducing in number, and there's more of those in Scotland and in London than in other parts of the country.
And there's nothing much we can do about that because they haven't been identified by the Royal Mail, they won't be identified by us. So we accept a certain amount that it's whichever household picks up the letter. But also, of course, we don't really know who lives in each household. Um, there is an electoral roll, but the one that's actually a bit of it that's available for commercial use, if you like, only contains about 35 to 40 percent uh, of households. Um, and it itself is dated in the sense that it only really tells you about who was living there at, the, at, a, at a particular point when they updated the electoral roll. Um, and some of that data can be out of date, especially for certain groups. So renters, for instance, it can often be out of date for that. Use of other databases. Now, we, we keep hearing about ONS building this master database of absolutely everybody. But even if they eventually do that, they'll probably extremely uh, constrain who can use it and how. Um, so it's, I don't think the creation of that frame will necessarily mean that address-based sampling uh, goes out the window. There's also, as I say, CACI, Experian, lots of other groups who effectively mulch together masses of data, do a huge amount of modeling and spit some stuff out for you at the end. Um, but although that can be helpful in certain circumstances, it's not helpful um, for uh, telling you about exactly who lives in the household and randomly sampling one person from, from within. It's not accurate enough for that. So we initially thought, well, we'll test the classic methods used in um, postal research, which is kind of quasi-random, where you just ask for the person in the household who had the last birthday, and maybe half of them you'd ask for the person in the household who was in the next birthday, or if there was some sort of seasonal bias for some reason or other. So we use these kind of classic methods. Um, but we also put in little items so we could check whether the person who responded really was that person. Uh, and we found quite substantial non-compliance. So about a quarter of the respondents were the wrong respondents, if you like. Um, and that, given that there's some households only have one person, it was actually about a one in three non-compliance rate. So um, is that a problem? Well, we'll come on to that. But it was, it was certainly there was plenty of non-compliance. And that SEN uh, tested almost at around the same time with, on the European Social Survey, tested actually doing it properly. So that they'd have somebody would go, anybody would go online, fill out exactly who the household composition and then the computer would select one person and they that person if it wasn't that person who'd, who'd who'd started it they'd be sent off to go and get the person who was supposed to actually do it who had been randomly sampled but they also included various items to check whether it was the right person and they found also lots of non-compliance in fact non-compliance at pretty much exactly the same rate as we found with the kind of quasi random birthday methods so we moved on from there and said, well, why don't we just get rid of sampling and we'll test a sort of all individuals method. So please, everybody take part. So then you're not having you've got this problem uh, in the middle. Now, this brings you, first of all, clustered data. It's an unclustered sample of addresses. But if more than one person responds for the household, then that data is clustered by household. And as we know, people who live in the same household are more like each other than a sort of random pair picked uh, from the population. So this, that tends to reduce the statistical value of the data. But in fact, when you actually look at it across lots and lots of variables, you find that the statistical reduction is quite similar to the statistical loss of value you get when you have to wait to compensate for randomly sampling one person in the household. So the statistical arguments against it don't stack up particularly much. Secondly, there are certainly lower printing and postage costs if you can get on the increase in the average number of people responding per address. There's also what we call risks of contamination. And this is, these contamination risks are, you know, affect all ho household surveys, but I think they particularly affect them if you've got online collection, data collection, where there's no interviewer there who's somewhat got governing how the data is, is collected on, spe on, on site. So there is also, for instance, a risk of one person completing multiple uh, surveys in order to pick up more incentives than they otherwise uh, would have done, which is uh, a, a risk we want to, do, want to look at. And we've, oft we've always worried about this to some extent, but I've done a recent study which suggests that community life estimates, at least, are not systematically different under the all individuals design than if I was to magically be able to randomly sample one person without any non-compliance whatsoever. So I tested this by 
the fact that the individuals who did respond will give information about the household and you can post hoc randomly sample one of those people and if you've got data from those people well they can go into the into the mix as, as it like as, as it were so then you can see well, what difference does it make if I get this sort of subset of subsample and then weight it in just the same way as I would do with the data that I've actually got so as an example here what I've done here is created an effect size so the difference between this subsample that with this random one everything's done perfectly post hoc sample and what we actually did which was actually ask everybody to take part uh, and uh, the effect size here these are all percent uh, proportion estimates so the effect sizes are at least twice as big as the real differences between the two but you can see that by far the largest uh, the most common effect size is one percent and there's a few that two percent or three percent one of the variables had a slightly bigger effect size i think you, those you read the literature on effect sizes these would be considered extremely small um, and suggesting that in fact it doesn't really make very much difference whether you randomly sample one who get everybody to take part or in fact I looked across lots of other different methods such as taking the youngest person or taking the first person who responded or the first two people who responded but it doesn't make a massive amount of difference because you've constrained the set of households who can actually take part in the first place um, so there aren't so for instance all the ones with one person households it makes absolutely no difference what what sampling method you use there of course but even in the two person households it's not a great deal you can run a random one or the other or the first one is going to have a 50 percent chance of being the same one as a random one or so on so you wouldn't expect masses of difference between them uh, but the all individuals method appears to be the one that gets closest to the sort of perfect random sampling within one household but this is still very much a kind of live issue. Uh, ONS is developing uh, some work, and they also, I think, Ipsos as well. So, uh, where in which you use a single username or passcode, in which any individual in the household can use, uh, that person completes the household composition data, and then that same username or passcode can be used by everybody else. But it's but who can use it, and how many is constrained by the original uh, household composition that. that uh, that person, the, the first person, has plugged in. Um, or alternatively, you could generate new usernames or passcodes based on that data from that first person, um, which has some advantages of data security, I think, over you know, reusing the same passcode. And there are lots of options in which you could use that. So you could say, well, the first respondent notes all these new codes down and passes them on, very low fi and I believe that's kind of what uh, some, some tests have, have used. The second option is that the first respondent gives email or mobile contact data for these individuals and then the research agency can send a link directly to these individuals. Uh, but again, you've got to collect a lot of information from one person. It's likely to be a lot of non-compliance with that. And the third option is that if, as long as you've got the name of the person, of these in individuals, you can post new letters out with new codes and they can go and complete the survey. So there's lots of things still to be done but as I say, it probably doesn't impact very much on any of the survey estimates themselves. But with random sampling, it's often as much to show that you've uh, done as much as you can to, to, to meet the sort of theoretical requirements as much as the practical uh, impact. So question two, how do you verify that the data is from the sampled individuals? Um, well, first of all, any verification of self-completion survey data has to be proportionate. If you are spending masses of money um, verifying this data, then one of the reasons for collecting data in the, uh, that way in the first place is lost. But you do have far less control than with interview surveys. So we kind of use a mixture of three strategies. So the first is um, actually just stressing as part of the questionnaire the importance of data validity, explaining also that the you as an agency will be using verification processes even if you don't describe exactly what those processes are to make it sort of on the one hand uh, ask people to be honest just open an open request for honesty but also say but we do do some checking uh, so kind of uh, uh, alternative motivations there strategy two is very much as i've described which is you could control the release of usernames and passcodes within each uh, sampled household Strategy three, which we rely on quite heavily, is a constructed algorithm to weed out completed questionnaires that fail uh, 
on set criteria, which are usually multiple criteria. So we use a red flag system so that one flag doesn't normally mean that we'll get rid of the data, but it'll make us want to inspect the data a bit more. And multiple flags, we tend to use a threshold approach where uh, you're out. If it's, like, it's kind of a three strikes and you're out sort of uh, process, but some of the signals of bad data are, are treated as stronger signals of, of, of invalidity uh, than others. But this isn't really tested in the sense of saying, does this algorithm actually identify all the bad data or not? Uh, we did attempt to do this by having, trying to recontact re people, but those that we thought had bad data were extremely unlikely to have given their details for us to actually recontact re people to actually check that. So there's a, a risk uh, uh, there that, in fact, your algorithm, while it's very clever, isn't actually doing quite the job that it's that is intended to. Um, just as a guide, we tend to exclude about 5% of the completed questionnaires for community life. But different clients have had different sort of um, th thresholds, if you like. So that's ranged between 2 and 10% on other surveys, depending on the, on the edit criteria. But we can generally live with that, so we'll just do a larger sample to accommodate that. Um, and it's certainly, as I say, a live question whether the combination of these strategies is sufficient, even if it in, is in fact proportionate. Uh, so, in other words, what is the risk to inference of including bad data through failing to identify that? Third question, how do you cover offline individuals? Um, based on data which I slopped together yesterday, which is 2015-16, it looks like about 13% of the adult population has not used the internet in the last 12 months. Um, so they are effectively not covered by an online survey method, or at least you'd think so. But if, in fact, you look at the internet usage data from uh, ABOS surveys, you'll find about 1% or 2% who've never used the internet before. So this will be their first go at the internet, is actually to complete the questionnaire. That group does appear in small numbers, and they, of course, are no, play no part in online panels. But you'll be surprised how many people will do that their first time. It's often older people who will have somebody helping them, um, a younger person helping them for the most part. But anyway, 13% haven't used in the last 12 months. This is shrinking fairly quickly, not because that group is changing its behaviour particularly, but simply because they're becoming a smaller part of the population. But they are particularly distinctive with respect to birth cohort and uh, educational level. I'll so show you a chart to demonstrate that in a moment. And government studies can't usually miss them out. Um, and I've, government studies can't usually miss out any minority group for the most part, or at least not clearly discriminate against them. So we do know, need to find some way of, of including them. So here's an example here. I don't know if you can see that that question about using the internet at home or elsewhere in the last 12 months is almost universal amongst the under 45 population but not universal amongst the older population. And here, I've divided up those who have any educational qualification against a fairly substantial subset that doesn't have any uh, educational qualifications. And you can see that there are some big uh, internet usage differences. And for, say, those age 75 plus, even with educational qualifications, it's only a little over half have used the internet in the last uh, 12 months. And those without educational qualifications, which is half of them, um, it's only about 20%. So there's a fair non-coverage bias risk uh, there. So most ABOS studies use a paper option as the alternative, which is usually available on request right from the first uh, letter. It will tell you about how you can get hold of one. But it's also used in uh, reminder packs, usually in the second reminder, second and final reminder. Um, and usually, we don't include question paper questionnaires in every one of the second reminders. We tend to apply it selectively so that certain strata that don't respond as well online as other do, others do tend to get the uh, paper questionnaires in the reminder packs, whereas other generally more affluent areas, we don't tend to include those uh, in there. Now, paper brings in different demographic types, certainly, I and mean, we, can, we can certainly see that. But it won't necessarily improve the overall sample balance if you actually wanted to say, right, well, I'll just wait. I've got all this data now, and I'm going to weight it. The weighting efficiency, which is effectively how 
much have you lost as a result of, waiting the of having to wait the data isn't very different whether you've included these paper questionnaires or you haven't included them. So although they bring in lots of different people, the balance isn't necessarily much better. And we haven't found a way to make that you know, perfect or anywhere close to it. Also, a paper option enforces simple questionnaire design uh, or a paper version that's limited more or less to the headline measures. So we often produce paper versions where there'll often be filters and filters and filters in an uh, electronic questionnaire, and we have to cut there. Now, some questionnaires, of course, have got so much filtering in that you just can't do by paper. And others, you can just about get away with it. So for community life, it's used because you can get about 80% of the data without too much filtering. So it's suitable for that. For the financial life survey that we did for the FCA, the most complicated question I've ever seen in my life, no chance in a, at all of doing that. So in that example, the alter we did an alternative, which was a parallel interview survey limited to the offline people under 70 and people who are aged over 70, because the people aged over 70 aren't brilliantly represented in the ABOS sample. 60, 69 is fine, it seems, but 70 plus, not so good. So we did a, a parallel face-to-face -face interview survey to pick up um, these groups. Now you might have said, well, why don't you just follow up some of them and the one non-responders and do interviews there? But that would have enforced that the whole sample became clustered, or at least a very large chunk of the sample had to be clustered. Um, and we preferred not to do that. Um, it was also, uh, logistically, the two surveys could run in parallel rather than the face-to-face -face having to be stuck onto the end of the uh, online survey uh, period. So we had quite a constrained fieldwork period, so that's one of the reasons for that. So it's a parallel interview survey. Now, the impact of including all this alternative mode data on the actual total population estimates are not always substantial. But subpopulations, it can make quite a big difference. It's just that, unfortunately, often your subpopulation sample sizes aren't quite large enough to detect uh, the effect and tell whether it's actually large or not. But as a, uh, an example of total population estimates here, this graph, um, the uh, x-axis shows uh, a proportion estimate from ABOS with both modes going into so online and paper. And up the y-axis, it shows it with just online, excluding the 30% of completions that were on paper. They were both weighted to the same set of uh, population uh, totals, so they had that in common. But as you can see, that the, the introduction of paper, well, we've got an R squared here of 0.998. Um, so it wasn't really making very much difference, um, all of that paper data. And it actually cost quite a bit. So in a sense, you might say, well, all the paper data is really just for show, because this survey only had a sample of 2,000. So it might well have been improving various su subpopulation representations, but you couldn't tell, because it wasn't really being used for that. It was being used for largely total population estimation. So what response rate does the ABOS method got, get? Uh, very much depends on the sponsor, the topic, the design features, and so on. So our worst one was 7%, and our highest is 25%, but we could have got higher than that. So there's a, there's, a, there's a big range there. I've seen some very recent ONS data of similar sorts of surveys, much shorter though, which have got over 30% on some, in some conditions. Um, the, the sample profile quality seems almost unrelated to the response rate itself. So by far our best was nine per, had a 9% response rate, but the response probability seems to be more or less random in that the population just fell out across about eight different dimensions almost exactly as it should have done. Um, so that was a 9% response rate survey. The 25% isn't as good as that, um, but as I say, uh, that's a fairly well-known feature of survey research. Certainly conditional incentives increase the response rate and they sometimes pay for themselves through lower printing and postage costs because you don't have to sample a bigger uh, number of addresses if your response rate is going to be higher. Tend to see about a 3 or 4% difference based per 5 quid that we put into the pot but there is a bit of diminishing returns after that so 10 quid isn't quite double that and 20 quid certainly isn't. I know ONS and we have ourselves tested unconditional incentives, but which are very popular in, in America. But the cost of these, when you're sending it out to all the addresses, when the response rate is actually quite low, 
co cost of quite a small unconditional response rate is about the same as quite a large conditional response rate. So as expected in experiments, it doesn't usually beat the conditional response rate, uh, conditional incentive in terms of getting response rate per unit of cost, uh, unit of expenditure. Uh, adding paper questionnaires to one of the reminders is an even stronger incentive. So you, though you think everybody's doing everything online, the paper questionnaires are not just for people who don't do things online or don't want to do things online. It actually brings in lots of, lots of people who just prefer to do it that way than uh, online. Um, and if you put paper questionnaires in every second reminder, you would get half the completes would be paper. So online is actually, people don't want to do it as much. Give them one chance paper and they'll take it. So, and because paper data is more, is, uh, as I said, quite constrained in what it includes, we don't really want to do that. We want to push them to, to web, but we have to include them in some, some ways if we want a higher response rate, as well as including some of these offline uh, individuals. Government sponsor, incredibly good. It needs to be clear on the envelope so people actually open it. I thought we did this recently, and in fact, the BBC has adopted this method for its main audience tracker. And when we tested it, I thought, BBC, that's got to be the best brand to put out there. No better than a barely known government agency, so, which I would count the Financial Con Conduct Authority as a barely known uh, government agency. We've also done for the Competition and Markets Authority and so on. They all did better than the BBC. So I was quite surprised at that. So a government sponsor is the one. If you, can get one, if you ha can't get one, try and get one. <laughs> Do your best to get one. Um, our current focus is on trying to limit variance in response rates between strata because the response rate is never going to be very high. But the next best thing you can do is make sure that it's pretty even across, uh, across different strata. So you're hoping that the correlation between response probability and the things you're measuring won't be that strong. So that's why we do. That's why we target reminder packs that include paper questionnaires in, di in, in particular types of addresses. Generally, the more deprived areas tend to get this. The affluent areas don't. You also vary the number of reminders. That's a good tool. Um, you there's some evidence for varying the type of reminder, but we I've recently been burned on a postcard where we sent some postcards out and they did absolutely nothing at all. So that was a good use of money. Letters seem to be more effective than uh, postcards, but it's quite new. We might see some examples other than that. Varying the messaging strategy between ways, so after somebody hasn't responded once and then hasn't responded twice, should you say different things in your, your letter? Well, we've tried that. We've not really detected any effect based on what we have written down. I think that's mainly because people don't really read very much and they kind of read to the important parts. And we have to include all this information because it's almost statutory requirement of doing surveys for government or academia. But in fact, people are just looking down, going, £10, that's a site, there's the post passcodes, and all the rest of the stuff that we might write is not being picked up that much. So potentially, we shouldn't expect very large effects, and our experiments aren't really large enough to detect uh, that those effects are there. Um, just, just a quick example here of how we use paper questionnaires here. So the community life survey here, uh, there's five strata based on the index of multiple deprivation, on the 20% most deprived areas to the least deprived 20%. As I say, we put paper questionnaires in all of the more deprived areas, a random sample of the middle ones and none at all in the others. So on the right-hand column, you can see what the person-level response rate is, uh, web only, and on the left-hand, when you add in both modes. So you can see here that we managed to almost even it up so that the response rate in the most deprived areas was 19% and the least deprived areas was 24%. So it's not a massive amount of variation, but it was the range was 10 to 23% uh, just on the online data, which requires a bit more weighting uh, to do. So five, how does response rate vary between uh, subpopulations? Well, we've done lots of these surveys and they are all slightly different in terms of what comes through. But a couple of things that, that clearly come through is that online response is more educated than average. Certainly percentage with degrees will be eight or nine percentage points higher than the population. They're much less likely to rent. Uh, they are, as I say, online response rates lowest in the deprived areas. They're also lower response in areas with lots of flats that aren't necessarily uh, deprived. Uh, paper questionnaires tend to bring in more people aged 60 plus, as you'd expect, but uh, 
and especially those age 75 plus who are not particularly well represented in the ABOS samples. We also think they probably bring in under 60s who have long-term illnesses or disabilities and or live in social rented accommodation. Uh, paper questionnaires seem to be helpful bringing those groups in. As I say, the sample balance measured by you know, population uh, percentages might not be uh, brilliant, but effectively you're bringing all the, uh, these people in, you've got the raw material for weighting the data to those population totals, whereas sometimes you just don't have enough cases from, from, from groups to actually be able to do that. Uh, overall, these profiles are less accurate than face-to-face -face interview profiles, which are, as Pat was saying, tend to have response rates of 50 through to 70%. So perhaps it's not unexpected that the profiles won't be as accurate as that. But they're quite similar to dual-frame RDD, which is, as I say, was our original sort of rival model. Uh, as I say, oh, have I said this? Maybe. Uh, critical to survey sufficient numbers of each type within the population because you're going to use multi-dimensional post-stratification. I tend to think with low response rate surveys that uh, non-response bias is usually, and some degree non-coverage bias, are usually the major problems. And you can afford to weight the data much more radically than you would with face-to-face uh, -face data where you've spent an awful lot for every single case. Here you've not spent so much for each case, you've got bigger samples and you can sort of shift them around a bit. And I think on balance it's better to do that than to be too cautious about weighting. And also the design effects due to weighting are fairly modest. I don't know if the concept of design weights is that, of design effects is that, that common. Uh, but gen I, well, I'll show you some examples in a, mi in a minute. But generally weighting seems to reduce the effective sample size is about 70% or so of the actual sample size. So it's not that much of a reduction. And that suggests that there's a reasonable raw sample balance, even if it's not perfect. And it's certainly, I think, worth assessing the weighting efficiency for each marginal subpopulation in the, ma in the weighting matrix, because then you can see, well, how, for a subgroup, say, 16 to 24 year olds, how much messing around have I had to do in order to get that, that group uh, as aligned as possible to population totals? And the less messing around you've had to do, the more confident I would say I'd be about that sample for other things that I don't have population totals for. So uh, example here, I suspect you won't see the percentages here, but this is the weighting efficiency, which is the effective sample size expressed as a proportion of the actual sample size. And this was for community life, 22% uh, response rate, paper questionnaires used as a secondary mode. Overall, efficiency of about 80%, but efficiencies of over 90% for under 30s and also again for over 70s. So it was actually a little bit weaker, but still in the middle high 80s for all of the uh, middle age groups. That's because age is by far the biggest discriminator in terms of response. So once you're actually within an age group, everything looks actually okay. There's not a lot of messing around actually required to do. And there's quite a substantial amount of weighting here. So gender by age group, highest qualification by age group, housing tenure, number of people in the household, region, ethnic group. So it's not, the fact that weighting efficiency is high is not really a product of simply not weighting it enough. Uh, so obviously if I didn't weight at all, the weighting efficiency would be 100%, but I'd have a lot more bias uh, in my data, one, hope, one assumes. Uh, I've mentioned it a few times, a financial lives survey here. So this was 7% uh, ABOS online response rate in face-to-face -face interviews is used the parallel uh, mode for a people aged 70 plus and offline who are younger. And here the weighting efficiency is more like 70%, so I had to do a bit more to it. The weighting variable is actually slightly more comprehensive, but not particularly much. But here is a slightly different uh, approach where the best, the, the least amount of weighting was done for the middle age groups and the most amount for the older age groups and the youngest. So it's actually the reverse of community life. Um, so two ABOS surveys aren't exactly the same. It's, uh, my finding from that. So that brings me on to uh, almost the end, non-response bias itself. Uh, well, most survey data lack benchmarks, which makes non-demographic bias pretty hard to quantify. Um, and for some variables, of course, interviews and self-completion questionnaires would produce very different distributions, uh, even if exactly the same sample uh, uh, completed both especially if you're using scales 
response scales, agree, disagree, or any other type of response scale as well. You tend to find self-completion, people tend to clump more into the middle and be a bit more negative about whatever it is that you're asking them about than, than an interview service. They aren't necessarily brilliant benchmarks uh, if you're using a self-completion self -completion questionnaire rather than an interview. Now, the three-year parallel run with the community life provided an opportunity to, for us to assess whole system effects, which is simply the difference between the ABOS result and the, uh, and the interview result. Uh, and they were of variable size, these system effects, but they were sometimes large, especially, as I say, when rating scales were used. And one of the things we did was we did a kind of ABOS-style follow-up of interview respondents um, and asked them to complete it online, weighted it as well as we could, and then compared that to the ABOS uh, data itself. And that suggested to us that most but probably not all of the system effects were due to measurement differences between these two modes, rather than because one survey had a response rate of 60%, the other one had a response rate of 20% of, uh, or so, and differences in sample characteristics that follow uh, from that. So that sort of study is quite valuable when considering a new data collection system, because in this case, the client could accept some measurement effects, but didn't really particularly want to deal with selection effects, which would naturally suggest that the ABOS sample was worse than the interview sample that they were replacing it with. But of course, there's lots of ways of analyzing that data. And I, NCRM themselves are going to reanalyze the data I used there and, and use different assumptions and see, if, see how robust that finding is to uh, changing the specification. But just an example here, if we just map the, um, the uh, system effects, which I think are on the y-axis, against the measurement effects on the x-axis. We can see here that by or large, most of the measurement effects are very similar to the um, system effects. And there's an R squared here of 0.77. Certainly a certain amount of scatter around it, which suggests there are other effects. There's more than sampling error. The y-axis is the actual difference between the ABOS result and the uh, interview result for all the results in the survey because each, each result is a dot here. Uh, and the x-axis is our calculation of what was due to the fact that there were different modes used and not due to the fact that there were different samples. Okay. So the y-axis is the system, system That's effect? the system effects, yes, as I say, on the, on the top. System effects there, measurement effects across the, uh, on the x-axis. But basically, they're clustered around the line sufficiently that one might think that measurement effects are the, the primary uh, cause. Just for complete completeness, here are the selection effects calculated from the same study. And although there is a correlation, the R squares here about is about 0.13, so quite small. And if, I think if you took away the, the red line, which is the line of best fit, you'd probably think, well, it just seems to be scattered about a bit. And the largest uh, selection effect is about five or six percentage points. So as large as measurement effect is about 15 uh, percentage points. So from this, I kind of drew the uh, conclusion that generally speaking, this was all due to measurement and not due to, due to selection. And the very final question, how much does it cost? Well, obviously the specific combination of design features that's adopted will influence cost. Uh, but for general population surveys, it seems to be about 50 to 70% of the cost of an RDD survey and about 15 to 20% of a face-to-face -face, uh, interview survey uh, done random. But they're far more expensive than using convenience samples. So I think Pat showed YouGov have five quid per complete, which seems extremely cheap to me. I'm sure we put higher prices than that uh, out there. But still, this is you know, several times more expensive than that. So you are spending money on getting random sampling. There are certain things it can do that panels can't do. So you can't target a hyper-local area with a panel, because panels have got people spread all over the place and so on. But mostly the panels have great, a little bit greater flexibility. You can do surveys specifically of subpopulations, but here, of course, you're effectively paying for people who, who aren't in the subpopulation as much as you're paying for those within the subpopulation, unless you manage to do some fairly clever uh, work with the sample design. Uh, so Community Life now incorporates a, an ethnic minority population boost, 
purely through applying different sampling fractions in different strata, ba with those strata defined by the ethnic mix, according to the 2011 census. And I didn't think that was quite going to work, but actually it worked almost completely bang on. So it is possible to do some of those if your population is reasonably well clustered and identifiable uh, in the census. And there's also some potential to use Experian and COCI data to improve efficiency, but mar it's pretty marginal. It's best for particular age groups, uh, not for any other subpopulation. And uh, finally, piloting is essential due to the wide variation in response rates. And that's as much to work out the cost uh, as anything else. I don't think we're quite at the point where we say it's going to be this percentage, uh, uh, although we, 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 we're, we're, we're kind of guessing to within a couple of percentage points now, but we're not absolutely, absolutely on it. <laughs>